me start off by providing a, a little bit of a background on the topic today. And I often lecture to cardiologists. And, and really, one of the things that I start off by saying as somebody really interested in prevention is uh, this fact that we often ask the right questions, but unfortunately, the wrong order. And what do I mean by that? As cardiologists and as healthcare providers and as Donald and the GEOMA know all too well, we often focus on the end of life, end stage uh, problem uh, to begin with. And that's where we spend most of our resources. When actually where we wanna be focused is really on prevention and focusing on improving not only health span, uh, not only lifespan, but also health span. And this is a, a form of thinking that's really um, uh, being very prevalent among the prevention community, where if you look at it, the best bang for the buck is actually in prevention, whereby preventing comorbidities and preventing risk factors to begin with, you can avoid end-stage complications. And unfortunately for our health system, you often reward the wrong behaviors. And on the left-hand side of this graphic, you'll see risk uh, and reward. Uh, unfortunately, I think high-risk um, higher risk behaviors and consequences of high risk behaviors are often uh, what's uh, rewarded because that's what you get reimbursed for, that's what physicians do. And we need to really change this uh, think radically in order to make uh, an impact on societal health. On the other hand, the other problem as we focus on health is to really look at it from a very, very myopic perspective that we focus again on really consequences. And then we start to examine risk factors what has become very, very prominent and well understood now is that there is a very large impact of factors that you might not readily discern with your senses. For instance, where you live in your environment, your zip code, uh, for that matter, your personal environment, how you sleep, what types of uh, you know, dietary practices you might engage in, your social environment, who your friends are, your relationships, your personal um, and professional um, um, circle of friends, culture, uh, governance, societal norms, all of these have an undue influence on health parameters, and in particular cardiovascular. In fact, some estimates seem to suggest that as much as 90% of risk for a heart attack might be because of these environmental influences, and a very small 10%, if you will, are underlying genetic consequences. So there's substantial opportunity to make a huge impact in terms of reducing cardiovascular consequences in health and health span in general by focusing on this larger wide angle perspective. Now, I don't have to tell you this, and I'm sure you didn't come here today to hear me talk about the fact that there's a, there's a lot of inequity in healthcare. These types of statistics have been around for nearly three decades, but unfortunately, this has been a very resistant metric in order to change. And this is really what uh, I think my talk is gonna be about, is how do you really move from knowledge and awareness to transformation. How do you move the needle? How do you move this very abysmal statistic staring you right in the face here where black Americans have two to 4.5 fold higher risk for stroke and myocardial infarction? And not only that, there's an underlying slew of risk factors, including hyperlipidemia, diabetes, um, uh, obesity, that's very prevalent in the black community. And this is shown here at the bottom. We traditionally recognize these as being related to socioeconomic factors, but I think from the broader lens of examining this, you might have to look at it from the environmental perspective and how these types of uh, associations are exaggerated, and this results in downstream consequences in terms of adverse cardiovascular events. Now, unfortunately, where we live in Northeast Ohio, unfortunately, is a hotbed for cardiovascular uh, illness, and this slide depicts this, and this is one of the reasons, one of the motivating reasons for Achieve Greater, which was a a large P50, which we were fortunate to get funded from the National Institute of Minority Health. And this highlights what's been going on in Great Lakes cities in the Midwest. And this is the tale of two cities in Cleveland and metropolitan Detroit, where you see that the heart disease is roughly one and a half to two fold higher than the national average. Not only that, there's a higher prevalence of chronic non-communicable diseases like cancer, chronic low respiratory diseases, Alzheimer's, uh, perhaps Alzheimer's is the only exception where you're below the national average, stroke, perhaps because of uh, relatively good genes in African-Americans, stroke, diabetes mellitus, and kidney disease. So the question is, how do we move the needle in these very abysmal statistics? It's very clear that Cleveland is ripe for urban 
transformation. There's a lots, lots of interesting groups that are working in this area in terms of improving neighborhoods, in terms of improving environment, where you live, transforming uh, vegetation in Cleveland, for instance, um, changing nutritional sources um, or access to healthcare, access to food. These are all huge questions that are going to have a tremendous impact on cardiovascular. And I really believe that's really the way to move the needle on these risk factors rather than focusing on the minority of patients that present to our hospitals with an event. And the, the, you know, underlying this is the recognition that there is an ongoing transformation in health analytics, big data, that can really provide unprecedented opportunities of delivering precision knowledge to an individual patient living in Northeast Ohio. So this is just a, a Google map. And I can tell you that you can use um, novel bioinformatic and informational approaches to extract information from maps like these to tell you at a very precise level what your neighborhood exposures are. And this is gonna be one of the topics that I'm gonna to touch on. So here's some work done by a colleague, Dr. Uh, Al-Kindi, who is very involved in this area, who's fortunate to have him be one of the investigators and in chief creator. And he and I actually did a lot of the writing that led to the funding of this grant. And this slide depicts uh, approximately five and a half, uh, 5.7 million deaths uh, at a county level in, in North America. This was done between 20, 2012 and 2018. And although a little bit complex, let me just walk you through it. So these are what, on the left-hand side, what you see are heat maps, which is the distribution of deaths across the United States. So red means areas where there's high prevalence of deaths or cardiovascular deaths. And likewise, the next heat map is of PM 2.5. This is a geographic distribution of where highly polluted areas are in North America. And you can see that most of the higher, uh, uh, higher areas of air pollution are predominantly in the Midwest and the American South. The, the Mountain West and the, uh, the West in the United States happens to be relatively cleaner uh, for air pollution. And then the bottom, you see social deprivation index. And this is a, an index that's using seven different parameters, ranging from poverty, education level, uh, whether or not you're renting, uh, where you live, et cetera. And when you put all this together, it turns out on the right-hand side now is a graphic depicting the relationship. And this is a, what's called a linear regression or a relationship between levels of social deprivation index. Uh, and on the... Um, um, x-axis is uh, air pollution levels. And you see uh, that the regression relationship or the tightness of the relationship is much better between air pollution and for instance, social deprivation index when you have higher levels of deprivation. So there's a co my point of presenting this is that there's a co-segregation of risk factors that you might not even appreciate. You might be living in a neighborhood that is exposed to high levels of air pollution that might be driving some of your risk for heart attacks and strokes. And we now, now recognize that air pollution can do a lot of damage, in particular to cardiovascular health. And in fact, the majority of illness attributable to air pollution is not respiratory. It's not asthma, but it's actually cardiovascular death. The global burden of disease, which is a very large compilation of data across the, the world, air pollution happens to be the number one cause of risk factors that drive cardiovascular mortality amongst environmental risk factors, that is. And it's perhaps the third most prevalent risk factor uh, apart from uh, hypertension, uh, smoking, and obesity, a fourth most common risk factor. Here's another analysis, which is very interesting. This is another way of looking at the effect of environmental exposures on non chronic non communicable diseases. And in this analysis, which is also done by Sapir, presented in abstract form, on the graphic on the top, you'll see bar graphs, and the red bars represent uh, the associations when you put 27 census tracts. Now, what are census tracts? Census tracts are what I would refer to as mini counties. They're roughly, um, um, you know, small areas within a county that uh, are approximately 2,500 to 8,000 people. And uh, they are, they've been assembled for census tract purposes, right? So you can get information of the census tract by conducting interviews, et cetera. And we can take that data, put that together, and then ask the question, do these predictors, do these census tract level, socioeconomic determinants of health, some of it are social determinants of health, including environmental variables like air pollution, black carbon, noise, light pollution. And this is across the United States, 70,000 census tracts in the United States. And you can do this with machine learning uh, models. And you'll see that when you use these parameters to ask the question, is there an association 
the cardiovascular health and environmental parameters using big data across the United States, there's a very strong relationship, as you can see. And the blue is just um, uh, social, um, uh, uh, socioeconomic variables, if you will, the socioeconomic variables. And then the red is adding environmental variables uh, as well. Uh, the blue is actually environmental variables. And then you add social uh, determinants of health as well. And you can see a much, much more robust relationship, suggesting that you can come up with very refined measures of risk and then use this intelligently, the technology, in order to identify populations that might be at need in order to obviate their risk. Now, uh, this is an incredible, incredible experiment. Mm -hmm. And um, you're all familiar with redlining. I don't have to tell you this. And it turns out that it's going to be 100 years next year in 2023, because in 19, 1933, right um, uh, at, the, at the heels of the Great Depression, uh, through a congressional act, the Homeowners Loaning Asso Loan Association, uh, Homeowners Loan, Loan, Asso Loan Act, actually was created. And this was an attempt in order to reduce the, the, uh, the difficulties faced by homeowners across the United States by providing them long-term mortgages and access to, to money because they were all debt-ridden at that time. Unfortunately, when this was done, there was a, there was a whole range of uh, adverse consequences, which included identification of neighborhoods that were populated by African-Americans, immigrants, and other minorities, where these loans were not made available. And this is referred to as redlining, as you know. And recently, approximately two years ago, the University of um, um, Richmond came out with a digitized version of the redlining districts. So when that happened, it was now easy to put together the digitized maps together with census tract information that I just showed you so that you can overlay information of redlining with other areas of socioeconomic stress, including access to care, unhealthy lifestyles. So in this experiment, what uh, Dr. Alkindi did was to take 11,178 census tracts today uh, that corresponded to the red line districts, put them all together, and the homeowners loaning a loan corporation at that time, in their infinite wisdom, put together four levels of loan risk, right? Best was A, B was still desirable, C was declining, and D was hazardous. And as you might have guessed, the hazardous designation was given to neighborhoods populated by African Americans and immigrants and other minorities. So now that this data was digitized, they could put the data together and ask the question, look, are these inequities still persisting? And I can tell you this experiment has been done by other groups, which have found the same thing, that these inequities that were uh, formally put into practice nearly 100 years ago still persist. And there's still, unfortunately, a very strong association between socioeconomic stressors, access to health, inequities that continue unabated. But what, what's new about this exercise was to figure out whether there's an association with other cardiometabolic risk factors and other um, metrics of cardiovascular health. And you can see in the bar graph, indeed, there's a very strong and fortunate relationship between HOLC grade, D being the worst, as, you, as I've shown you before, and a variety of different cardiometabolic risk parameters, diabetes, smoking, obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. And this translates into a higher risk for cardiovascular disease, stroke, and chronic kidney disease. So my point of uh, showing this, and this is coming out in press in a major journal called the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, is to show that unless we start to address some of the underlying issues, we're never going to be able to solve these issues. And this is going to take a lot more. And it's going to take all of us working together with uh, groups like Better Health Partnerships to bring attention to the area, but not only really that, move this forward and transform the area. Now, this is, again, a very similar exercise looking in Northeast Ohio here, and we're doing a very similar experiment where we are overlaying redlining districts, which is shown here, I believe, I can't see this in my slide here, but I believe the redlining districts are probably on this, this side, on the left-hand panel, A, B, C, D, and that quite nicely overlays the prevalence of chronic disease, cardiovascular disease, and stroke prevalence. So this is going to be coming out pretty soon. So how do we get to solve these problems? I'm a strong believer that precision medicine and technology is really has to be a part of, part of the solution in order to do this. And when we talk about inequities to care, there's a fundamental problem. There's a problem with care delivery, which is not only really just uh, something uh, that's uh, um, applicable to the African-American or disadvantaged community, but just about to healthcare in general, where there's a problem 
with the, uh, ensuring that your patients get access to the right treatment, that they are diagnosed appropriately, that they utilize appropriate health services, they have access to the appropriate health services, and furthermore, finding ways in which they can adhere to those therapies. And again, there's a revolution in physician medicine tools where we can use big data approaches, machine learning, AI, in order to provide a very refined estimate at low cost, right? Mind you, at low cost. And this will all be done behind the scenes by a computer that can come up with an algorithm that tells you you're at risk and notify physicians and other healthcare providers. So by combining the little tools for precision medicine and precision care delivery, I strongly believe you can, and by focusing on the environment that people live, you can start to make, um, um, transform the area. And this is what I call innovation with purpose, because we do need the little tools. We do need to think about the environment. We do need to think about social consequences. What does healthcare give back to the community? How do you engage communities? And obviously dominance mechanisms to do this. And I can tell you that ESG is foremost in the mind of every corporate um, 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 company in the, in, in the top 500, in the NASDAQ, they're thinking about ESG and how to innovate the purpose. And I truly believe this is where the future is. Now, we're gonna talk about Achieve and I'll give you an overview and I'm sure Ijeoma is gonna be talking about it. And obviously we have the pleasure of having Jeff Patterson from CMHA, but we could not have done this without collaboration with our neighborhood partners like BHP, as well as uh, 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 Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority. So this is why we're here. Achieve Greater is a P50 center and the uh, goal is to use technology, precision medicine, uh, big data to bring innovative solutions to uh, change the high prevalence of risk factors in Detroit and Cleveland. So what do we plan on doing? Well, we plan on doing this in a small scale in, in 500 individuals, perhaps more, uh, that will be identified um, uh, in the Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority, where they'll be screened for uh, adverse uh, exposures, including prevalence of high prevalence of blood pressure, diabetes, uh, smoking, and other psychosocial element. And this is where I think the magic happens, where a community health worker that will work as uh, literally a health concierge will work with each of these individuals to identify the socioeconomic needs and uh, bring solutions to the table. Uh, through innovative platforms um, that can provide us information in real time so that we can actually help people. There's another component to this, which is that of precision medicine, where each individual, and we'll talk about this, will be provided access to a battery of digital devices that allows connectivity um, 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 and awareness of risk factors. And uh, the community health worker is going to be a very important part of this. We also plan to use a precision medicine tool, which is clinically approved called a calcium score. That's a very accurate estimate of um, cardiovascular risk. And underlying all of this is this intervention that we, that we have called a pragmatic, personalized, adaptable lifestyle and life circumstance intervention, which is really a, a tool that we are going to facilitate utilizing the community of work. What do I mean by that? Well, it's pragmatic because it really links patients to existing and available social services that, when, that they may not be aware of in the community, personalized because depending on their circumstance and the level of education, as well as other help that they might need with medication adherence, this might really provide a motivational tool to really help uh, patients in a very um, uh, um, you know, practical manner. Adaptable because this is care delivered by phone, web link or community settings or in the home. And again, the focus is on risk factors, including lifestyle and certainly life circumstances. So I mentioned calcium scoring. Calcium scoring is available for free uh, at UH. It has been uh, available for free for the last uh, four years. I believe it's a massive effort and it's uh, the world's largest program that provides us for, uh, for benefits. So we get patients from the Cleveland Clinic that we do calcium scores for free because we don't charge money for it. And I think the idea is quite simple. Simple, the, the simplicity of this is by providing patients with this information, it empowers them. It helps identify using precision medicine perspective who's at risk. And then you can target them for appropriate population. I'm very proud of this slide, which is by since 2018, since we introduced this, uh, we have really targeted um, uh, women. You can see this, there's an uptick in the uh, utilization by women. Uh, symptoms of cardiovascular disease are often not recognized in women appropriately. African Americans and disadvantaged citizens in society. And you can see roughly 49% of our patients in our program make less than $60,000 a year. So this is a, a, a tremendous effort uh, in terms of community engagement. So we will use this technology as well in order to identify risk. And then if they happen to be high risk, 
give them the clinical care that they need, provided it's acceptable to patients. So there's a lot of patient engagement here and really getting to understand the cultural and environmental context and meet patients where they live, where they want to be met, right? And if you happen to be low, low risk, we continue uh, this, uh, uh, this concierge care with the uh, uh, social, the, the community health worker. Now, uh, I, I mentioned technology. This is the other technological innovation. Every a patient would be provided with this smart device. It's very simple. It doesn't require wireless. It doesn't require connectivity. It doesn't even require a cell phone. All it is is a hub. You, you plug it into your uh, wall socket. Um, it needs electricity, obviously. And once it does that, it automatically connects through all four devices that are provided. This includes a smartwatch that tracks sleep as well as activity, a blood pressure device, a scale, that's automatically connected. So we have real-time awareness of information that the community health worker can then provide to the patient. The patient also will have access to this information if they happen to have a smartphone. Patients who need drugs will be provided uh, medications, will be provided a, a Bluetooth-enabled um, pill box, as you can see. So every time they open the cap, we know when they're taking their medications. And we, if they have a cell phone, we can also send them text reminders to take those medications using smart technology. So this is what the patient flow would look like. These devices and data hub are just provided to the patient. Patient plugs the data hub into the wall. Once the hub is active, the patient can go about their normal life um, and they might have to check their blood pressure once a day. And once that's done, they don't have to do anything. It automatically goes to the cloud. We have access to the information and they can all have access to their information as well because this really helps engage patients and make them aware of their activity levels as well as sleep levels. And then, as I mentioned, we can give them reminders and notification uh, that can be sent directly to the patient if they want, if they want that, that is. And this way, we can really make an impact on some of their cardiometabolic risk parameters. So thank you again. I think the work is just starting right now. I could not be more thankful to Jeff Patterson, uh, colleagues from uh, CMHA, who've been infinitely patient and also kind with their time. Clearly, Better Health Partnership and Reader, you've been a great leader, a great collaborator. Jonathan, all my colleagues at the University Hospital, a special thanks to Severe and Ken Kendi White and Jackson Wright, who are our colleagues at uh, CASE. And obviously, you'll hear from Ijeoma about all the wonderful collaborators in Detroit that we happen to have the good fortune of working with. Our team, uh, a chief rater team here, uh, starting with Heather Conga, Fonda, Kiana, Yasli, Tyler, and everybody else. So thank you again for the opportunity.